When the China Inland Mission withdrew from China in 1951 and started work in other Asian countries, its name was changed to the Overseas Missionary Fellowship. Together with many other like-minded mission groups, OMF seeks to witness to the truth so clearly established in this story of Hudson Taylor's life. God's work, done in God's way, will never lack God's supplies. In our day, when the world closely and curiously watches every political and military development in the great country of China, this is the story of one Westerner who not only understood China, but changed its history. Millions of Christians in China today can trace their spiritual lineage to the life and work of Hudson Taylor. In a day when the spiritual, moral, and financial failures of some of our culture's most visible Christian leaders have embarrassed the church and damaged the cause of faith, Hudson Taylor's story provides a startling, refreshing, and inspiring contrast. For it is a story of a Christian giant who, led by serving, who diligently, carefully protected his integrity, who constantly, purposefully avoided personal material gain, and who refused even to take offerings in meetings where he spoke about his work because he wanted to depend entirely on God's provision for both his personal needs and the needs of his ministry. In a day when Christian missionary organizations around the world are striving for nationalization of their work. This is the story of a man whose mission organization held those goals more than a century ago. In a day when much of the Christian church still debates the role of women in spiritual leadership, this is the story of a man who so respected the strength, potential, leadership, and faith of women that he ignored the conventions of his time to give unprecedented responsibilities and opportunities to the women of his mission. This is the story of a man who understood the basic principles of cross-cultural communications a century before our communication experts even began using the term. This is also a story of a man in a formal, unemotional age who managed to be a romantic lover and an affectionate father. It's the story of a man who witnessed firsthand and battled against the major crisis of drug addiction and homelessness. It's the story of a man who experienced the frustration of physical suffering and wrestled with the pain of personal grief. It's a story of one man who discovered a faith and a secret that enabled him to accomplish the impossible. Could Hudson Taylor's story be relevant to readers today? I decided that it was. More than a century before Richard Nixon reestablished diplomatic ties between the United States and China and opened up communist China to the Western world, a young Britisher landed in Shanghai. Barely 20 years of age, he had no university degree. He was sent by no government official. He arrived unexpected and unannounced. No one came to meet his ship. No one in China even knew his name. But Hudson Taylor was the man who opened the great country of China to the Western world for the first time. And the legacy of his life and work continues today in the lives of millions of people throughout China and around the world. Hudson Taylor was not some holy hermit. He was a successful professional, a family man. He was a man of common sense, living a life of constant change in the company of many interesting and varied people. He wasn't an imposing man at all, small in stature and far from strong. He had to live with physical limitations. Next to a loving Christian family, the only real advantage he had in his early years was the experience he gained from supporting himself from the time he was about 16. He was a hard worker, a trained medical assistant. He was able to care for a baby, cook a dinner, keep accounts, and comfort the sick and sorrowing. Yet, he was also an innovative leader, an organizer, and a skillful delegator who provided spiritual leadership and inspiration to thoughtful men and women the world over. Above all, he determined to test the promises of God. In doing so, he overcame difficulties few men have ever had to encounter. His life work changed the world he lived in and has had an impact on millions of people. What was the secret of Hudson Taylor's life? 
What was it that enabled one man to make such a great and lasting impact? That's what we're going to discover in the pages that follow. Chapter 1 The year is 1832 to 1850. James Hudson Taylor never appeared to be an exceptional child. Though his father had the education requirements to be a pharmacist, Hudson's parents decided not to send him to school until he was 11. While he was a sickly child, missing at least one day of school almost every week because of illness, he quickly learned to read and showed a proficiency in math. But at the age of 13, after just two years of formal schooling, Hudson gave it up to help in his father's shop in the town of Barnsley in Yorkshire, England. Born in 1832 to devoutly religious parents, Hudson heard early and often the gospel story of Jesus, the only Son of God who came to earth and died so that people's sins could be forgiven. And with a childlike faith, the young boy accepted what his parents taught him simply because they believed it. As a teenager, however, Hudson began to question the reality of the Bible. And when at the age of 15 he took a junior clerk position in the local bank, and became exposed for the first time to the influence and opinions of older and more skeptical friends, Hudson abandoned the Christian faith and the teaching of his family. Even after eye strain forced him to give up accounting, and he again began working with his father, his doubts about Christianity continued. Though he wasn't outwardly rebellious, his parents recognized his spiritual struggle and worried about their son. Then, at age 17, something happened. Hudson later recorded the events of that day. On a day I can never forget, my dear mother being absent from home, visiting relatives some distance away, I had a holiday, and in the afternoon looked through my father's library to find some book with which to while away the unoccupied hours. Nothing attracted me. I turned over a basket of pamphlets and selected from amongst them a gospel tract that looked interesting, saying to myself, There will be a story at the commencement and a sermon or moral at the close. I will take the former and leave the map latter for those who like it. I sat down to read the book in an utterly unconcerned state of mind, believing indeed at the time that if there were any salvation it was not for me and with distinct intention to put away the tract as soon as it should become prosy. I may say that it was not uncommon in those days to call conversion becoming serious, and judging by the faces of some of its professors, it appeared to be a very serious matter indeed. Would it not be well if the people of God had always tell-tale faces, evincing the blessing and gladness of salvation so clearly that unconverted people might have to call conversion becoming joyful instead of becoming serious? Little did I know at the time what was going on in the heart of my dear mother seventy or eighty miles away. She rose from the dinner table that afternoon with an intense yearning for the conversion of her boy, and feeling that, absent from home and having more leisure than she could otherwise secure, a special opportunity was afforded her of pleading with God on my behalf. She went to her room and turned the key in the door, resolved not to leave that spot until her prayers were answered. Hour after hour that dear mother pleaded until at length she could pray no longer. Dear mother pleaded until at length she could pray no longer, but was constrained to praise God for that which his spirit taught her had already been accomplished, the conversion of her only son. I, in the meantime, had been led in the way I have mentioned to take up this little track, and while reading it was struck with the phrase, The Finished Work of Christ. Why did the author use this expression? Immediately the words, It is finished, suggested themselves to my mind. What was finished? And I at once replied, A full and perfect atonement for sin. The debt was paid for our sins, and not ours only, but also the sins of the whole world. Then came the further thought, if the whole work was finished and the whole debt paid, what is there left for me to do? And with this dawned the joyful conviction, as light was flashed into my soul by the Holy Spirit, 
that there was nothing in the world to be done but to fall down on one's knees and accept this Savior and His salvation. When Mother returned a fortnight later, I was first to meet her at the door and to tell her I had such glad news to give. I could almost feel that dear mother's arms around my neck as she pressed me to her heart and said, I know, my boy. I've been rejoicing for a fortnight in the glad tidings you have to tell, and went on to tell the incident mentioned above. You will agree with me that it would be strange indeed if I were not a believer in the power of prayer. Nor was this all. Some time later, I picked up a pocketbook exactly like my own, and thinking it was mine, opened it. The lines that caught my eye were an entry in a little diary belonging to my sister, who was four years younger, to the effect that she would give herself daily to prayer until God should answer in the conversion of her brother. One month later, the Lord was pleased to turn me from darkness to light. Brought up in such a circle and saved under such circumstances, it was perhaps natural that from the commencement of my Christian life I was led to feel that the promises were very real and that prayer was a sober matter of fact transacting business with God, whether on one's own behalf or on the behalf of those of whom one sought his blessing. Without ever becoming the kind of serious Christian he thought so appealing, Hudson tried never to take his faith lightly. Like most young Christians, he would sometimes fall to temptation and feel discouraged by his continuing weakness. But he never let himself feel satisfied with an up-and-down spiritual life. He longed for a better, more complete relationship with God. And one particular afternoon he began to pray about that longing. Well do I remember how in the gladness of my heart I poured out my soul before God. Again and again, confessing my grateful love to Him who had done everything for me, who had saved me when I had given up all hope and even desire for salvation, I besought Him to give me some work to do for Him as an outlet for love and gratitude. Well do I remember as I put myself, my life, my friends, my all upon the altar, the deep solemnity that came over my soul with the assurance that my offering was accepted. The presence of God became unutterably real and blessed. And I remember stretching myself on the ground and lying there before him with unspeakable awe and unspeakable joy. For what service I was accepted I knew not, but a deep consciousness that I was not my own took possession of me which has never since been effaced. Though he had committed his entire life to God, Hudson continued to struggle with times of failure and discouragement. It was in one such experience of defeat and discouragement that he called out to God for help. He so wanted to live a life pleasing to God in every way that he felt he would go anywhere, do anything, suffer however the Lord asked, if only God would give him the assurance of his clear direction. Never shall I forget, he wrote long after, the feeling that came over me then. Words could not describe it. I felt I was in the presence of God, entering into a covenant with the Almighty. I felt as though I wished to withdraw my promise, but could not. Something seemed to say, Your prayer is answered. Your conditions are accepted. And from that time, the conviction has never left me, has never left me that I was called to China. Hudson Taylor's immediate response to what he clearly felt was God's calling for him was simple and practical. From that day, he began to prepare for a life that would call for physical endurance. He took more exercise in the open air, exchanged his feather bed for a hard mattress, and carefully watched his diet. Instead of going to church twice on Sunday, he gave up the evening to visit in the poorest parts of town, distributing tracts and holding cottage meetings. In crowded lodging house kitchens, he became a welcome figure, and even on the race course, his bright face and kindly words opened the way for him to share his faith. The more he talked about God to others, the more he realized he needed to know. So he began devoting even more time to prayer and personal Bible study. And of course, if he planned to go to China, he needed to learn Chinese but a rare book of Chinese grammar would have cost him more than $20 and a Chinese-English dictionary at least $75. He could afford neither. 